This is the largest UFO wave we've had in Pennsylvania in 35 years. What's going on in Bucks County? Total mayhem. If that was a plane, it would have fell right out of the sky. You want to find that wow image, the one that's going to say, look, we've got them, they're here. Did he saw a very, very unusual phenomenon. If we can validate the story, what we have is an unidentified object in that airspace. UFOs exist. What is not certain is what they are. The Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, watches the skies, investigating sightings soon after they occur. Their investigators use the tools of science, psychology, and law enforcement to get as close to the truth as the truth will allow. Unidentified flying objects definitely exist. Only their identity remains a mystery. The mystery of UFOs over Earth. I'm excited. I'm excited that they're coming, I'm excited they're at my back door. I am waiting to see what the culmination of all this is. It, to me, is something that is at the forefront of a breakthrough. When they're talking about a flap, essentially what you have is the occurrence of a number of sightings in a fairly short period of time in a given geographic location. Most UFO sightings occur with an individual. They happen, then they're gone. Once in a while, you get a mass sighting. In 1997, we had the lights over Phoenix. It was seen by 10,000 people. It was seen by the governor of Arizona. But flaps are rare because they can last for days and sometimes months. And then one day, just as quick as it starts, it stops again. And nobody knows why. So you want to take advantage of it. You want to look into it as quickly as possible. This is the largest UFO wave we've had in Pennsylvania in 35 years. We normally get 8 to 10 sightings a month. We get 63 reports in July. There were 25 more in August, 32 more in September. Why all of a sudden is Pennsylvania seeing all of this? Something's going on. Even though there are different days and different times, we're seeing a description of some very common objects. The activity that we're looking at right now is about seven times more than the usual. We've put together all our information so that we have a map of all the sightings. A lot of people have reported different objects and it's interesting to note that these objects vary from a cylinder shaped object to a boomerang to a spear. All it was was a white ball of light. So I ran inside and I grabbed my astronomer binoculars and I honed right in on that son of a gun and there was no structural features at all. It was just a white, pure ball of light. I've only been investigating for MUFON four months now. I'm out here to figure out what the hell's going on out there. It was ball shaped kind of. It was just like... Multicolored? Yeah. The most brightest like dominant colors were blue and orange. I was sitting out on my porch and I just happened to look over and there came a beautiful blue sphere. It was a beautiful blue that I'll never forget the color. Like a, a blue basketball with maybe a light inside of it to, to show the blue. You know what I'm saying? Take a boomerang and put a football in the middle and it had red lights in the front. Or... When you look at these objects that are being reported, they're giving different descriptions to it. But you still got this large group of people that tell a very compelling story and they're very believable. What would you say if I told you that four other people that night had a sighting that they reported? I'm not crazy. <laughs> 80 percent, maybe 90 percent of these sightings are actually IFOs. But there's always that unexpected 10 to 5 percent that remain unexplained. And that's what I'm after. The first thing I do is to ask what would be the motive? What would be their reason 
for coming forward and actually saying, I'm seeing these things. I realized it was, you know, a solid object. It wasn't shaped like a plane. I've never seen anything like a plane that looked like that. It didn't make any noise. It moved very slow. If, if that was a plane, it would have fell right out of the sky. As Cliff is telling his story, I'm thinking, here's an average person, or a retired person, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night and sees something he doesn't understand. I think the fact that you have over 50 witnesses, they don't know each other, they don't know of each other, I think that says something about this investigation, that something real happened, that these people saw something that they can't explain that looked unnatural to them. So I happened to see uh, four objects coming round, you know, lit balls. You know, we're looking up and they're out there and, you know, two of them were kind of stationary. Now that they make that type of a sound? Yeah, that's uh, the usual A-10 uh, warthog flying by and uh, that's pretty close. They, they usually don't fly over a house like that, but... Uh, <laughs> but the sound from the UFO, so they sound like well, this. There was no sound whatsoever from the, these sites. So that's unusual. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No How did you feel at that point? Were you afraid? Uh, were no, you I was, just, I was a little bit uneasy because they were absolutely silent. That was what struck me was there was no sound whatever. When she gives her description of those four objects just like her husband, I mean it was a very believable, compelling description. Yeah. To speak to them, you're convinced that these people saw what they saw. We live within five minutes of the airbase, so I've come to be able to identify all kinds of military aircraft, F-14s, F-18s, A-10 Warthogs, you know, the whole bit. And I immediately knew this was nothing that I could identify as either a commercial aircraft or a military aircraft. It was something, you know, totally different. Could this be ours? Not unless we have some kind of blue ball ships. You know, I'm seeing a bigger story here clusters of people, people with good backgrounds, they're all coming forward, but people don't have evidence. Did you uh, at any point want to take your eyes away and go get a camera? <laughs> um, I never, you know, the thought never occurred to me because I was fixated. Yeah, remember I was mesmerized. just yeah. mesmerized, fixated, and I, I just couldn't take my, my eyes away. You know, one of the things that I wish would happen is that someone else would see it and maybe get it on film. I thought it was a helicopter, but it wasn't making any noise, and it didn't have, like, one light. It had three lights, and they were on the surface of the object. It was kind of freaky, kind of like a boomerang. Okay. Now, that was in April. I'm currently working on 60 cases right now. Part of what makes Denise's sighting the most uh, special out of them all is that she's had multiple sightings and a written report with their specific dates and the time frame. In May, same thing, uh, the dog woke me up, we came out, and as soon as I came out the back door, it was above this tree right here, directly. Okay. Then the next time, I guess it was in um, June, mm -hmm. and it was the same exact spot again. It seems like it's in these two spots every time I come out. Now, I did see on your report you said there was a cone of light that came Yes, from yes, there was. I saw this glitter coming down from the object into this tree and also this tree. It was like glitter. And I thought, oh, this is really weird. I'm not telling anybody about right. this, you know. And next thing I know, I saw the glitter leave both trees and go up to the craft. She's telling us this situation of these metallic sprinkles that came down and landed in her backyard. You know, I, I found that a little hard to believe. Then as we researched and got into it a little bit more, we find out that there was a case, I believe in 1999 in Mexico, same exact thing. It was just silver, it was sparkly, and this tree was full. It almost looked like Christmas lights. A little bit here on the outer, outer leaves. I have a portable Geiger counter. So I said, let me see if we get any trace elements off of this. As I put it on the branches, in towards the center of the tree, you didn't get any readings. But then as you got outside to the, the perimeter of it on the top of the leaves, it was clicking, it was going off. I'm like, wow, this is something solid that we can work with. Each case, you take through a process. You go through the whole investigative process. You gather up soil samples, you gather up uh, vegetation samples. 
and then put all the pieces of the puzzle together to see what happened. Log the case number and the date location and we'll send it off to be analyzed and we'll see anything that's uh, not of this world. That brought it to a different level. That brought it to a different level of expertise. Then we find out that Denise has photos. She's got pictures. Denise's case became very important to us. It was beautiful looking. This thing had no lights, seemed like it wanted to be unseen. An estimated 10,000 UFO sightings are reported each year. MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, chronicles these sightings, but only investigates those they consider credible. The following is an account of one such investigation. I just happened to look over and there came a beautiful blue sphere. We were about like right here and it was flying that way didn't have like one light, it had three lights and they were on the surface. Denise's investigation is really what you hope for because there's a lot of evidence coming together here that says something really happened here. Hi Denise. Hi, how are you? Good. This is uh, Tim. This Hi, is nice Mark. to meet you. Hi Denise. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm going to work on creating some artwork. We'll work together on okay. making it look as accurate as we can to what it is okay. that you've seen. It was just something like you weren't sure what it was, but it was it was beautiful looking. Like triangular or yeah, kind of like a boomerang shape. shape. Take a boomerang and put a football in the middle. They had red lights in the front, bulgy red lights that were kind of pulsating. You mentioned there's a four pinkish light. That right. Like, Say where like if be? I see this right. in the sky, there'd be a pink light flickering. First time I saw it above this house over here, the rooftops. On one of the evenings, I think you said that it dropped some kind of a substance that came down. Or... It was all glitter, and then it went into this tree. So now the goal is to be able to build a craft, put it where she saw it, and recreate her sighting in the actual spot where it took place. When it comes to photographs, you want to find that wow image, the one that's going to really say, look, we've got them, they're here. So this was in May. What did you see with your eye? It looked like uh, three giant headlights of a car. Three headlights? Mm -hmm. It's giant three headlights, that's what I usually see first. In any kind of pattern, configuration of any kind that uh, you recall? No, not really. It was just uh, the round object, the, ro the round part of it. It's like three giant headlights, just looks like a flat surface of an object with the lights. As I'm looking at her pictures, uh, the part I didn't understand was how you could look at you know, a triangle that's got three different colored lights on it, and you're showing me a picture of something that looks like a golf ball. So in this first one, this was 4-20-2008. Where did you take that picture? If you could just take your camera and walk right over there and go okay. check it out. Sure. I asked Denise to recreate the manner in which she took the pictures. I wanted her to use the same camera. Over top this tree. So I just aimed it up. Mark said she held the camera at, at arm's length. I think what she was doing was pointing it in the direction of what she saw, snapping, almost like if you're at an event and you're snapping over the crowd. You think you're getting what's going on, but you don't really know. And I, I think that she may have thought she photoed what she was looking at and was off, and it might not even be in the frame. I spent a, a good deal of time last night going over all the images. In this image that was submitted, I noticed uh, this clearly over here, there's this bright blue ball. And that's interesting looking in and of itself. So to, to look more closely at that, I've zoomed way in, brightened the image, and I looked at that object and what I saw inside the object were arcs. So one thing you can notice is if you complete these arcs there's a bright object just off frame right about here. Maybe that's what she meant. Maybe that's our object. Maybe that's the coolest thing in the world.
but it's here. It's not there. That could be the object that she meant for us to see, and it might have been a very interesting object, but she didn't catch it. <laughs> I believe that this person took something that was genuinely intriguing and interesting, but so far, and I have more analysis to do, there's quite a few pictures, uh, so far I don't see anything that's not explainable so far. Can you, uh, can you show us where, where your second sighting took place? Uh, yeah, it was outside if you want to go yeah, out there. Yeah, let's go out there. Okay, so here we are. It was right between those two pine trees, mm -hmm. and then I realized it was, you know, a solid object. I think one of the most compelling witnesses so far has been Cliff. I mean, there is no reason for a retiree who's had a good life and a good business to come up with this story. This is about where it happened. Like, okay. We came out here, of course, it was dark. It was like 4 o'clock or so, and it was still very dark. Okay. And about the time we got back out here, it was probably right around there. And it was a lightning flash. And when that flashed, I saw the whole object. And it wasn't what I expected because when I saw it before, it looked like a, just a hexagon, dark, solid object, I guess you'd call it. This time, the lightning shone through cracks in the object, and it kind of divided it up into almost uh, six equal triangular-shaped things. He saw the craft, and, also, and he saw the light coming through the seam, so he knew there were six different objects connected. And his, his description was it's as good as it gets. How big would you say it was? It was at least from where we are to the tree line, width-wise, and probably maybe even wa even longer than that because it seems to be like elongated. He calculated this thing to be in excess of 300 feet. So this is an enormous craft. I mean, this is a you know a baseball or a football stadium flying over his house. So I was a little upset of seeing what I saw because I didn't expect to see that. Okay. You know, I just didn't. I didn't think the lightning was going to you know illuminate it the way it did and uh, you know I was, I was a little set back do you, do you have any concerns that this is the second time you, you've seen it over your property yeah I just want to get on with my life <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I, I don't want to see any more yeah. <laughs> he's a little afraid and I think he's a little concerned as why this keeps coming around his neighborhood why is he the one that's seeing it Cliff and Denise they've seen something more than once and that becomes exciting for us because it wasn't a one-time deal Yeah, would you take your eyes off of something like that? I wasn't moving. Didn't really believe the story of the metallic sprinkles coming down, but that's the part of the case that's actually come to fruition. It got right near my house when it briefly turned red, and then bang, it was going, it vanished. It was going really fast, so it had, like I said, that motion over here. This is such a good case. We've got so many witnesses, we've got physical evidence, so I called James Carey on the international director to enact our star team just because I wanted to make sure that I covered all the bases. The star team is made up of a, a group of elite MUFON investigators who can be deployed at a moment's notice wherever there's a major UFO event. Yeah, listen, that's the video that I told you about. This is a really incredible case. There's a number of sightings, and any of these cases that are associated with any kind of physical evidence, we're going to focus on those first. We're not here to take over the investigation. We're here to help them and provide technical support and experience. When you have members of the STAR team coming down, that in itself is an indication that we've got something here that's a little bit more unusual than just a rash of sightings. Denise, when you saw these flags come down, did they reach a certain level and then get sucked back up yes. right away, or did any of them reach the ground and get sucked back no, up? No, none of them reached the ground. They went, they came down simultaneously, and it looked like Christmas lights. It looked like it was Christmas, like they were all glowing. Well, I already knew Denise's story. She had multiple sightings of the same object. It's glitter coming down from the object into this tree. They were top this tree. I knew that she had taken these photos, we had seen the photos beforehand, but we were a little at a loss to understand why is it that she saw this object five times, but didn't have a clear photo of it. Denise, you said this was a giant craft, 
Mm -hmm. If you were looking, just put your fingers up there and tell me how big the object would have been in, in the uh, on the screen there. Yeah, it was pretty big. But in your pictures, and nothing that big shows up on the pictures, which is what we find odd. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand yeah. how it is you could look through the camera, and you said you could see the object inside of the screen as being very large, but right. we're not seeing it show up on film. We're not seeing it actually show up in the picture. Did you look at all the pictures? Yes. Yeah. Did you have time to put your glasses on? No, I never it? had time to get my glasses okay. on, ever. So you took the picture? Because you never knew when it was going to go away, so I didn't want to go in the house and miss it or whatever, but no, I never okay. had my glasses on. Why do you think you haven't seen it since? I really don't know why, but I hopefully they're going to show themselves to somebody else. That's an unbeliever, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, I had no idea. You started off as a non-believer? Yes, that... I was. Okay, and now? And now I'm a believer. It's pretty cool. Denise, does this look like the object you saw? Yes. Yeah, except it goes slower. When it kind of goes in a shuffling pattern. What do you mean by a shuffling pattern? When it's going across the sky, it kind of just shuffles along. So you're saying that we, we the way we have this illustrated here, it's a pretty smooth trajectory. But right. You're saying it's a more zigzag kind of thing? Yeah. Should we take a look at the uh, yeah sparkles here? like Christmas. Oh my gosh. Is that what it looked like? Yeah, except it was twinkling more. But other than that, just Dude. like it. And they just pulled away and went up yep. just like that. Just like that. I just can't believe someone can capture what you've seen, you know? It's like if these guys were there. Do it again. And when we talked about the sighting and the glitter, she seemed much more confident. She was very direct. Her answers were spontaneous. And she seemed like she was telling the truth about that. But she's alleged that that glitter had come down in the trees and illuminated the trees. And she stood there for 20 minutes and watched it, never thought to get a camera. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. Yeah. Now, would you take your eyes off of something like that? <laughs> I wasn't moving. When we showed her those metallic sparkles, sprinkles coming down onto the tree, she lit up. That hit it right on the head, that this was exactly what she saw coming into those trees. So to me, that was confirmation that we got something good. It's always like flickering. It's like a little flicker. MUFON is a nonprofit scientific research organization. We work with a wide network of experts who offer their skills and expertise to MUFON. Dr. Levengood is a retired professor who's intrigued by UFO investigations. He has his own lab and will look into interesting cases for UFO researchers. When we took these leaves and sent it to a lab for testing, we never thought we were going to get the type of report back that we, that we did. Professor Levengood's report said that these leaves and this tree was hit by some form of radiation. At first glance, this looked very suspicious because the leaves had a reddish coloration. That never happens in June or July normally. But here the energy level was so high that it caused the production of anthocyanin, a pigment in the plant that causes the reddish color in the leaves. Now, this was a real unusual situation. The energy not only produced this cream-colored region, but you got little bubbles for when the microwave heated the cytoplasm so fast that I, I'd never seen before at all. This whole thing took place in a matter of microseconds. Denise saw a very, very unusual phenomenon. Another obvious thing that was occurring in these leaves. Notice the heart shape. This is extremely unusual. This is called a somatic mutation. Here are the normal leaves down here. They come to a point. So they're quite different, you'll notice. Why? Because these microwave energies came along and just hit that leaf bud's tip. And it didn't kill the cells, but it slowed the growth rate way down. I don't think we can escape the fact there was some area of the sky that emitted 
and energy that caused these changes in the leaves. He's found stuff that he's never found before. The new growth is actually mutated. Changes that wouldn't happen unless something came in contact with microwaves. I don't think Denise walked out back with her microwave and popped the tree branch from up top into it. I sold the whole object. I wasn't quite sure whether or not I was losing it. The guy has really nothing at all to gain by making up a story like this. Our MUFON investigators are volunteers. Their full-time occupations range from police detectives to computer graphic designers to aeronautical engineers. They bring their skills to each investigation. description of the UFO I think is probably one of the most detailed ones I've ever gotten. It didn't make any noise, it moved very slow. If that was a plane it would have fell right out of the sky. This thing wasn't smooth or, or aerodynamic in any way. He was very specific about the top of the craft had windows that came along the edge. The interesting thing about his description was there were no lights. So many UFO stories involve lights in the sky. This was a completely dark craft. And the only way he saw this was that the heat lightning lit up the clouds behind it. This is a very useful tool to me because it's one thing to hear a description of someone, but once you show them an animation, it's interesting how they will start to really pick out what's wrong about it and help us refine it, and we get to a really good view into their mind as to what they saw. Cliff, I'm going to show you the animation. Let's uh, go ahead and play it all the way through once, okay. and then we'll play it again, and you can stop it at certain points and, and then point out whether it's accurate or not. Initial impressions? Very, very realistic looking, but... Um it's too smooth on the sides from what I could see there. It didn't look quite like that. And if, if you're trying to get in the perspective of how I saw it, it wasn't going this way. It was going like kind of a, away from me. So that down the bottom, that wasn't the, definitely... So it looked more it. like a P2. It was cut six slices. It was yeah. more consistent yeah. on the bottom here. So it was still gray, like the color no, of the here sky. Here we've got a black. And, uh, yeah, no yes, black. Yeah, but, but no black. Yeah. You can't really see the seams. Well, was, there any, was there any lighting at all in the craft itself? Or no. So. Cliff's reaction to the animation, he made elaborations on it, uh, going back to the very first description he gave me and the first drawings that he showed me. You're seeing someone who is relying on memory rather than imagination. After Cliff saw the animation, he opened up and started to tell us a lot more about what happened to him. And, and that's what really what we were hoping for. There were some things that happened during both sightings that I didn't really bring out because oh, okay. I, I, at that point, I know what I saw, but I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure whether or not I was losing it. You know? What it was doing as it, as it went along, it would, it would kind of jump and you would see it here and then you would see it here. Well, it kind of goes in a shuffling pattern. What do you mean by a shuffling pattern? Like, when it's going across the sky, it kind of just shuffles along. So it's almost like you were filming something and that's the only object that was moving. It would look like it, it was here and then it skipped and it goes there. The object skipping through the sky. When he got into that mode of explaining that, that's sort of what tipped me off that there might be a little more to, to it than was initially realized. Very unusual. To me, Cliff seemed like an extremely credible witness. I don't see how this guy is going to at all benefit by coming forward with a story like this. He has so much more to lose than he has to gain. In terms of his standing in the community, the way his neighbors are going to view him, the guy has really nothing at all to gain by making up a story like this. It's not exactly what I saw, but it's the best I could do for I think he's coming forward because he's seeing something that he can't explain, that he wants someone to 
verify it for him. And just like any kind of credible witness, they wonder about their own sanity. They wonder when no one else can validate what they've seen, whether it's something that they've made up. But his deep conviction tells me, and his stability tells me, that what he's seen must be true. Very little of what he had to say makes a whole lot of sense. I managed to isolate some very small flakes of a white compound. There is something intriguing here. It's like the, uh, a regular airplane light, but there were so many of them. They would start as balls of light, then morph into a craft. When I got Levin Good's analysis, I was intrigued by the fact that something may have chemically altered these leaves or caused mutations in the growth, but I knew that I had to get a second opinion. Dr. Salisbury is a world-class plant physiologist. We took Levingood's report and we forwarded it on to Dr. Salisbury for him to just take a look at it and tell us whether he agreed with Levingood's analysis or not. Unfortunately, he starts right off jumping to conclusions. He jumps to conclusions throughout the whole analysis. Uh, Levingood says that the brown spots were because of anthocyanins. This looked very suspicious because the leaves had a reddish coloration. That never happens in June or July normally. To me, that's a tremendous uh, conclusion jump. The only way that he really would know that they're anthocyanins would be to, to do the proper tests, uh, chemical tests, uh, no real reason to think they're anthocyanins. Then there were mutations. He finds some of the leaves have a heart shape. But the idea that they were in response to a mutation is again a, a huge leap into the unknown. For one thing, leaves don't particularly grow that way. They don't grow at the tip like stems do. They form in the bud and then the cells expand to make the leaves. Okay. It was disappointing, but also I said to myself, isn't this typical? I mean, no matter what you do in this field, there's always a skeptic or somebody else to come back with the opposite. So in this case, we have one scientist on one hand that's saying, yes, we have something here. Then we turn around and submit his report to another scientist who takes the opposing view and says he doesn't think what the first one told us was valid. There's several photos that were interesting. Let's take a look at this one. My understanding is that this is the image that she's told the investigators was a pretty direct representation of what she actually saw that night. What do you think of it? When, when you look at this image, you see what looks like a bright, splotchy looking image. So now you have this and that. So here we see the bright image. You have to identify that and also account for what this is. What's that? I asked Denise to take me outside and show me exactly where this was. You got the coordinates and then... I did. I did a compass bearing of 220 degrees. I could then plug it into some of my astronomy programs that I have. Get the celestial picture. Get a celestial cool. picture for that exact time and date. And, and we're see, looking we're doing from her backyard and just that, like it would look. That's right. She said it was somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning. And I have it set for 1 in the morning right now. All right, if we move the time ahead a little bit, Okay, now we're around 2 in the morning, and lo and behold, well, here comes the moon and Jupiter. And that would put you in line with the tree line? Actually, it would put us right in the tree line, and the moon was full. You can actually see leaves silhouetted against the moon in this image, and that explains why the moon was round behind the trees. Gotcha. All right, now... When you look at the image, you see that the orientation of this moon and that Jupiter are not the same as in the photo we saw. Yeah, but you said she had the camera turned up this she, way, too. She could very well have turned the camera vertical for that shot, and that would explain exactly what we're seeing. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's yeah, perfect. It's a perfect correlation. 
Mark and I went through all Denise's photos, and there was really nothing there. Mark felt everything was either reflections off the lens, possible aircraft lights, and other bright lights in the sky. There was nothing there that Mark couldn't explain, and it was really disappointing. Denise's case is falling apart, but we don't want to give up on it. We collected samples from the tree that the UFO was seen hovering above and dropping down this glitter into, but we also took some samples from a tree that was much further away to act as a control. What did you find different between the two samples, the affected and the control? The big difference was in a very minor element, boron. It was a difference that jumped out at me because in the affected tree, that value is several times higher, and so that might let you have a stronger hypothesis that something was deposited on the leaves from some other source. What Nick was able to tell us was that there is something intriguing here, that something seems to have happened to this tree that's next to Denise's home, and uh, I think it lends a little more credibility to her story. Then Nick told me about the flakes. I managed to isolate some very small flakes of a white compound that I found on a few of the leaves from the affected tree, and I did not find any amongst the leaves from the control tree. Flakes from the affected tree exhibited a, a really unusual series of forms or shapes at a microscopic level, the largest of which was probably about the size of a head of a pin. These white flakes, uh, do they have any shine to them? Is this possibly the glitter she's talking about? Well, if there was a, a shower or some kind of a cascade of flakes that would have been of the size of that one, uh, I would say that if you had a bright light source shining on them, they probably would glitter. I mean, they would show up, I would think. It's been a real roller coaster ride with Denise's case. We thought we had this compelling evidence that just came tumbling down. But then Nick comes forward with these unusual flakes and boron content, which makes Denise's story more compelling. So maybe something happened here after all. That's exactly how it was. It's eerie. If we can validate the story, what we have is an unidentified object in that airspace. MUFON annually investigates an average of 5,000 reported UFO sightings. Approximately 85% are dismissed as either misidentification of natural phenomenon, man-made activity, or deliberate hoax. 15% remain unexplained. Everything in our arsenal comes off of this Willow Grove Air Force Base. We've got uh, Harriers, they have C-130s, F-16s, uh, Warthogs, you name it, it comes off of this base. But no hexagonal aircraft that we know of. That's pretty close. They usually don't fly over a house like that, but... Uh... <laughs> but the sound from the UFOs, so they sound like well, this. There was no sound whatsoever. I immediately knew this was nothing that I could identify as either a commercial aircraft or a military aircraft. It'd be important for us to go in and maybe interview the base commander. We're trying right now to set up an interview for you guys. Do you really think they're going to tell us anything? Well, if it's, a, if it's an exotic top secret craft, I really doubt it, but I think it's worth the shot. I mean, we have to talk to them. We have to give them their opportunity. Absolutely. How do you get to the truth? I mean, you know that the government knows. They have to know. They monitor everything. And we keep plugging away, you know, at this low level, trying to find out what the truth is, and it's very frustrating. The photographs have really not helped her. They've hurt her more than anything. And, um... I was really trying to, just in my own mind, clarify which one of these things she'd actually seen or not. Oh my gosh. Ooh. It's eerie. Now, the next one was when the, when the lights came down and went into the, the, the tree in the backyard.
It's so true and exact the way I saw it that night. Yeah, it does. Is that pretty bad? Yes, it does. It looks just like it. That's exactly how it was. Good. What really got my attention, she got very emotional when she saw it. And it seemed as if that took her back to that night. And based on that, I was starting to believe what she was telling me. We tried to adjust this to make it look as close to what you saw as possible. Okay. Uh, that's pretty good, but it makes it look like it's a, a very small object. This thing was immense. And, and the height of it, and as big as it was, set me back. I did manage to go down to Philly International Airport and take a look at the radar tracks. There was something that came in on the radar without a transponder code. And it had the right time setting and the time frame, the date frame, as when Cliff had his sighting. The transponder is a device, it's a piece of the radio equipment on an aircraft that basically transmits a code number to the air traffic controller's radar. And when they dial that number in, that number basically lights up on that blip on the screen and identifies that blip. Going through congested airspace like Philadelphia without a transponder, it would be like driving up a, a vehicle up the wrong side of an interstate highway at night with no lights on. And this craft did come down, flew around, went west, turned around and made a U-turn and came back up and headed back towards New York. If we can validate the story that we've gotten from the individual at the Air Traffic Control Center in Philadelphia, then what we have is an unidentified object in that airspace. I don't remember any cases, but I'm sure we can look back through our archives and see if there's anything similar. It's a possibility. Most of the witnesses I've talked to have been very convincing, very down to earth. It gives me an idea that there has to be something out there, like they say there's smoke, there's fire. I believe that what we have to do is just keep asking these questions, doing these investigations, so that the public knows it's okay to come forward with their reports and eventually, you know, we're going to get an answer.